Welcome to Stagecoach Podcast, where you will find the best Western books on the market. This podcast is brought to you from Dusty Saddle Publishing, also referred to as DSP. The home of Western excellence, where around the world people still enjoy the Old West, and DSP works hard to provide great Western novels for readers to enjoy. First, let's dive into the plot. Finn Sullivan continues his adventures in the beautiful but unforgiving American West in this continuation of his exploits featured in Finn Sullivan, Mountain Man Wolverine. Finn and his loyal youth partner, Little Dove, find themselves on the dark, dangerous trail of a sadistic, cold-blooded Assiniboine Indian appropriately named Rattlesnake. Along this mission, they meet new folks from far-off lands and find themselves in more than a little bit of trouble. Will they catch up to the murderous, poisonous rattlesnake, or will they succumb to the punishing West before exacting justice? In this episode, we'll be reading Finn Sullivan Mountain Man, Rattlesnake, Book 2 by author Scotty V. Casper. This is Part 1. Without further ado, join us as we read. Chapter 1. Moving on. Four Indians on horseback rushed out of the rear opening to the cave and into the valley that Finn Sullivan and Little Dove had called home for the winter. It was early spring. The Indians' faces were painted for war, and their horses were decorated with handprints and braided manes. The Indians were magnificent horsemen, and they let loose with several arrows as they raced by the people standing outside their five cabins along the right side of the valley. The valley was only 300 yards wide and a half mile long, a mountain man and his woman were struck with arrows as the Indians dashed by. Most of the arrows were released from below their horse's neck, an improbable way to shoot an arrow, but the Indians were adept at it. The two people, Bud and Lawanda Borgstrom, fell to the ground. Lawanda had an arrow sticking out of her bosom, and Bud was struck in the shoulder. The Indians rushed on by, and their intention was to flee the area. They didn't want another skirmish because they knew they would be at a disadvantage because the mountain men would have guns. There was a flaw in their reasoning, though, because they were in a box canyon, so they would be constrained to pass by the mountain men a second time on their way out of the valley. Everybody get your rifles, and let's give them a warm welcome when they ride by us a second time, Finn shouted. Four mountain men, including Finn, scrambled for their rifles and assembled outside of Connor's cabin. Connor was one of the mountain men that lived in the canyon, and he was their leader by default. Little Dove left her newborn baby on the bed in the cabin and appeared outside with her rifle. She was a Ute Indian, and she had been in several life-and-death confrontations, and she was as good a shot as most men. She figured the baby would be all right left alone for a little while. Connor. An Irishman like Finn had discovered the canyon five years earlier, hidden behind a half-mile-long cave. He had invited his four trapping partners and their women to move into the canyon. One couple had left and moved to California, seeking the land of milk and honey. Finn and Little Dove were the last couple to be admitted into the canyon. Earlier in the fall, Finn and Little Dove stumbled into the canyon, being pursued by two murderous Indians that had partnered up with a treacherous Indian named Wolverine that liked killing people, for no good reason, and cutting up their bodies. Finn was able to kill Wolverine just before they discovered the utopian-like canyon. Connor made them go back out through the cave and settle the problem with the two Indians before he would allow them to join the other four couples in the canyon. Finn and Little Dove had dispatched the two Indians, at least they thought they had, and then moved into the vacant cabin to spend the winter. While they waited for the four Indians to ride back by, Connor looked angry. Did you lie to me, Finn? Did you fail to kill those two Indians last fall? My worst fear has been realized. People from the outside world have discovered our little canyon. Hostile people. Connor. I didn't lie. We shot both of those Indians. You should know me by now. I don't lie. Well, how do you explain these heathens defiling our beautiful canyon? I don't know how they got in here. I just don't know. Maybe we can just wound one of them and get some answers from him, 
Little Dove can speak to him because she will know their language. A tension-filled half-hour went by and the four Indians didn't try to rush on by. Finn quickly dragged Lawanda Borgstrom back into her cabin and helped Bud into the cabin as well. There was nothing that could be done for Lawanda. She told Bud she loved him, and then she sighed and died. I'm so sorry for you, Finn told Bud, but come over here and I'll pull that arrow out of your shoulder. Is this going to hurt? Bud asked. Of course, but the arrow has to come out. Finn took hold of the arrow and wiggled it back and forth and finally edged it out. He wanted to avoid pulling out the shaft and leaving the arrowhead in the shoulder. Bud, hold this cloth on the wound and apply pressure. You've got to stop the bleeding. Hopefully we'll be able to come back into your cabin before long and give you medical attention. Finn went back outside. What's taken those Indians so long to come back by? Finn asked Connor. They're scared to ride by. They've been trying to scale the cliffs down there and get out of the canyon, but it's too steep. The four Indians didn't have any choice, so they went flying by, hugging the far side of the canyon as best they could. They hung off the side of their horses, exposing as little of their bodies to rifle fire as possible. The mountain men knocked over three of their horses with the first volley. I hate shooting horses, but I don't want any of these Indians to escape this canyon and then come back in here again, bring in more of their friends, Connor said. It had to be done, Finn said. Now let's go over there and finish them off. Oh, look, one of them is getting away. Shoot him. Somebody shoot him. He's sitting upright on his horse again, and he's a fine target. Nobody could shoot him because they were all busy reloading their rifles. One of the mountain men took a shot at him with a horse pistol, but he missed by a wide margin. The Indian raced along, and when he was 400 yards away, he jumped off of his horse and dashed into Finn and Little Dove's cabin. He was obviously looking for one of the mountain men's wives that would be vulnerable. He was only in the cabin for a few seconds. Then he rushed back out, leapt on his Mustang, and rode away. It didn't take him long, and he rushed back into the cave and disappeared from sight. Let's have a turkey shoot on the three injured Indians. When they fell off of their horses, it didn't do their health a lot of good, Finn shouted. While the mountain men were finishing off the Indians, Little Dove ran down to her cabin. Don't bother shooting the one on the left. He's hurt so bad that he ain't going anywhere, Finn said. The other mountain men took care of the two Indians on the right, and they all jogged over to make sure they were dead. Finn approached the one on the left. He was still alive, but not for long, because he had a broken back and he was busted up inside. He was grimacing in pain and breathing deeply. Who was the Indian that escaped? Finn asked. We are of the mighty Assiniboine nation, and his name is Rattlesnake. He is a mighty warrior, and he will kill you, all of you, the Indian said in broken English through clenched teeth. How did you find your way into this canyon? Finn asked. You shot me last fall, but I survived, the Indian croaked, and I knew there had to be another opening to the cave, he managed to say. He sighed, did a death chant, and died. The other mountain men went to get a couple shovels to bury the three Indians. They didn't want their carcasses stinking up their valley. They decided to bring out a couple of their horses and drag the dead horses clear down to the end of the canyon. Digging a hole for them would be too difficult. Connor followed Finn down to his cabin, and they found Finn and Little Dove's month-old baby girl dead with an arrow sticking in her tiny, delicate body. Little Dove was sitting on the bed, wailing pitifully and slashing at her arm with a green river knife. It was an Indian custom. Finn rushed over and jerked the knife out of her hand. Cutting yourself isn't going to bring our baby back, he said. Eleven months earlier, Little Dove had been raped by Wolverine, an Indian that had been cast out from the Ute tribe, and he had gone on a rampage killing, raping the women and dismembering everybody he met. Finn and Little Dove had discussed at length what they would do if their baby's father turned out being Wolverine. They decided that the baby would be innocent, 
and they would love it no matter its paternity. The little girl had raven black hair and obsidian eyes. There was no doubt the little girl's father was Wolverine, but she was a precious little human being, and they loved her dearly. Little Dove was a tiny little thing, and the birth had been difficult. She had bled badly and had almost died. That, in part, was one of the reasons Little Dove took the baby's death so severely, but more importantly, she loved the little girl immensely, and losing her was traumatic. Finn tossed the knife off to the side and took Little Dove in his arms. They held onto each other and cried. We'll get through this, Finn said, and we'll make another baby. Connor decided to give them privacy during this painful ordeal. I'm going to go and work on Bud Borgstrom's shoulder wound and help to bury his wife. I'll see you both a little later. We need to talk. Finn bandaged the two cuts on Little Dove's arm. Then Little Dove dressed their baby girl they had named Morning Dove. Little Dove dressed her in her finest clothing and Finn carried her out to the meadow where the other mountain men were digging her and Lawanda's graves. It took a couple hours to dig the graves and Bud cried over Lawanda's grave and spoke a little prayer. Finn carefully laid their baby girl in her grave and backfilled it. Then he read a short prayer from a prayer book. Those we have held in our hearts for a little while, we hold in our hearts forever. They both cried. Actually, nearly everybody cried. The community had lost Bud's precious wife and they had lost a baby girl. Nothing would ever be the same. Be aware, though. The women sobbed loudly, but the men simply had their eyes fill with tears. Mountain men are supposed to be stalwart, stoic, and indifferent to human emotion. It has to be so, in order for them to survive the rigors of the wild, lawless West. After the burial, Connor approached Finn so they could have their talk. I'm worried that Indian that got away will come back with friends and try to wipe us out. That would be unfortunate because we are sheltered in this little valley and we're not bothering anyone in here, Connor said. Indians feel threatened by the white man's presence. We've had this vast territory to ourselves for centuries, Little Dove said. But don't misunderstand me. I don't have a problem with white men. Connor... I can't guarantee more Indians won't come, but I can guarantee that I am going after the Indian that killed our baby. Perhaps I'll get to him before he rounds up some friends and comes back here. Little Dove and I are moving out of here tomorrow. Connor, we appreciate you letting us winter here, but it's time for us to move on in order to catch up with that Indian and hopefully get some trapping done. We'll need beaver pelts to earn money to spend at the rendezvous so we can buy supplies to take us through next winter. We'll miss you, Connor said. We've got this potential Indian problem, but nevertheless, Molly and I are going to have to make a trip back to Ireland to settle an estate there in Drakita. Connor, would it be worth it to you to go to Dublin if you could earn $5,000 in American money? For that much money, I'd fly to the moon. Connor said. But are you making a joke? No joke. My father was killed, and he left me a cotton cloth factory. But before I was shanghaied, I turned over 49% of the company to a trusted attorney named Lorkin. What I'm trying to say is I expect I am worth a lot of money. I'll write a note so that attorney Lorkin will believe you when you ask him for $15,000. You would need to exchange the pounds for dollars before you leave Ireland. That's 10000 for me and 5000 for you. Are you interested? Yes. I've never had such a large amount of money. The estate I'm settling in Drofdale will only pay us $500. Well, good. I'll prepare the note for you before we leave tomorrow. Do you think you can return with all of that money without losing it or being robbed? I'll try. You know better than to tell anyone you have it, right? Yes, I wasn't born yesterday. Finn nodded his head. Find out what happened to the mansion I used to live in. Ask Lorkin if the cotton cloth factory is thriving. Find out how much money he has put in my account 
and ask about my dad's evil brother named Ronan. Hopefully that bastard is dead by now. The next morning, Finn and Little Dove gathered all of their possessions, including four extra horses they had accumulated. When they were getting ready to leave the canyon for good, Bud Borgstrom approached them. Bud was a huge Swede with gigantic shoulders and arms, blonde hair, and a warrior-like disposition. This canyon doesn't seem near as charming to me, now that I have lost Lawanda. I want to go with you to find the Indian that got away and kill him. Finn looked over at Little Dove and raised an eyebrow. What do you think? He asked. Why not? She asked. Hurry up and pack your stuff and get your horses, Finn said. Finn and Little Dove stood outside their cabin and watched the sun over to the east rise above the horizon and spread its golden rays slowly across the canyon floor. It was a beautiful spring morning and the green meadow was radiant and it smelled fresh and pure. They caught the perfume of a nearby patch of wildflowers. Suddenly, a flock of birds swept into the valley and settled into a stand of quaking aspen and set up a cacophony. I'm going to miss this valley, Little Dove said. Me too, but it's time to move on and fulfill our vendetta. That treacherous Indian has to die. I want to kill him myself, Little Dove said. But what's a vendetta? It's a promise we've made to find that damned Indian and kill him, Finn said. Yes, we've made a vendetta. You teach me new words nearly every day. I don't know what I'd do without you. Chapter 2. Duplicity Just before Bud joined Finn and Little Dove, Connor walked up. We'll miss you. Where will you go? He asked. Finn patted him on the shoulder. First, we're going to hunt down that Indian that got away and settle his hash before he comes back into your valley. Then, I suppose, we'll go where the wind takes us. I need to try my hand at trap and beaver so that I can sell plues and have money to buy supplies at the rendezvous to take us through the winter. But where will you live? You haven't got a home. Finn shrugged. I don't really know. I suppose we will build a cabin. Finn, if you'd like, I can give you 18 buffalo hides to make a teepee. I'm sure that little dove knows how to make a teepee. Yes, I do. Little Dove said. Are you sure? Would you actually give me 18 buffalo hides? Finn asked. Absolutely. You were our best hunter last winter, and you must have killed at least half of those buffalo yourself. Thank heavens it was a gentle winter, and we all could get out and hunt. All right, we'll take you up on that offer. After you settle the account with that murderous Indian come back into our valley, and we'll load you up with buffalo hides. Thank you, Connor. You're welcome. Finn looked over at Little Dove. Little Dove, did you look over the arrow that killed our baby? Yes, it was a Cinnaboyne, wasn't it? Sometimes you can't believe a dying man. Yes, he was an Assiniboine, or some call them Nakana. Take your choice. Do you know where their village is located? Yes. Well, that's the first place we are going, Finn said. I wouldn't do that, Connor said. You might get your top knot lifted. It's a chance we'll have to take. Connor, good luck on your trip to Ireland. Bring us back some money. When do you think you will get back? Hard to say. More than likely, I won't be back by the time you come for your hides. I'll tell everyone in the valley to turn them over to you. You shouldn't have any trouble. You are well respected by everyone. So long, Connor. So long, Connor said. Little Dove walked up and gave Connor a matronly hug. Before long, Bud rode up on a buckskin stallion trailing a roan pack horse loaded with his equipment. Are you ready? Finn asked. Ready. Connor was a fine figure of a man. He was dressed all in buckskins that his late wife had fashioned, and the outfit was new. He had long blonde hair down to his shoulders and a peachy complexion. But most notable about him 
His entire body was rippling with muscles. Finn wondered if he was the offspring of Vikings. How's the shoulder? Finn asked. It hurts, but I'll manage. Good. I'll have little Fawn look at it every day to make sure it doesn't mortify. Oh, and she will change your bandages. Thanks, Finn. All right, let's ride, Finn said. They rode through the cave toward the outside world. The cave was damp and as foul-smelling as ever. I want to visit Cash's grave before we go on, Little Dove said. Of course, Finn said. Finn looked over at Bud. In case you are curious, I met Cash on a sailing ship as we transported cargo all around the world in a ship named the Temo Shanter. We were shanghaied. It was a brutal, unhappy time in our lives. Cash was an older mountain man that got shanghaied when we was visiting New Orleans. He took me under his wing and taught me many of the things I need to know to survive in this wild, lawless Western country. He was a wonderful man and he was killed by a treacherous Indian named Wolverine. Little Dove and I miss Cash very much. We were going to go trapping together this summer. Bud jerked at the buckskin's bridle when the horse started sidestepping and throwing his head around. It had to have hurt the horse's mouth. I'm sorry you lost that old fellow, Bud said. I'm sure I won't be able to replace him, but I'll try my best to make you a good partner. If you've never trapped beaver before, I'm sure I can show you how it's done. I have experience. I'm sure you'll make a good partner. I watched you when we were fighting those Indians yesterday, and it looked to me like you're a man with a bark on, and we'll need that if we get attacked. By the way, I've never asked you, where are you from originally here in America? I was born and raised in Wisconsin. My parents migrated there from Sweden back in 1801. French explorers named our location Coureurs de Bois, and it was later named Green Bay. We had a dairy farm and sold milk to families who lived nearby. Where was your wife Sophia from originally? Finn asked. He was trying to get to know Bud better, since they were going to be partners. They hadn't talked much last winter so Finn was trying to determine the man's worth, and what he had discovered so far was positive. Sophia's people originated from France. She was French-Canadian. When she and her family migrated south and settled in Green Bay, I talked her into marrying me and going west. She was a sturdy, hard-working, God-fearing woman, and I loved her with all of my heart. His eyes filled with tears and Little Dove joined in and shed a few tears for the deceased Sophia Borgstrom. The threesome made their way to the mouth of the cave, but they decided to camp there where they had spent a few days with Cash before he was killed. It was raining and it was a torrent. Suddenly cloud-to-ground lightning splintered in shards and hit a nearby tree near the mouth of the cave and tore it apart. Fragmented light streaked across the interior of the cave, and then a tremendous thunderclap tore the air apart and nearly broke everybody's eardrums. We're being punished by a storm god, Little Dove said. How's that possible? Finn asked. It seems that every one of us has a pure heart. Well, I don't know about that, but something is wrong here. Sorry, Little Dove but I don't believe in this so-called storm god, Finn said. Sometimes I'd like to knock you in the head, she said laughing. They were stuck in the mouth of the cave for two days because the rain never let up. On the third day, they ventured out to get on the murderous Assiniboine's trail. That afternoon they stopped and Little Dove fixed dinner, but it wasn't much of a dinner because they didn't have meat. After dinner, I'm going to go out and make meat, Finn said. Wouldn't it be better to wait until the morning, Little Dove asked? No, because I want to go back to that lake we just passed. Animals come down to drink late in the afternoons and I want to be there in case I can get a shot at an elk or a deer. But you'll be coming back in the dark, Little Dove said. I'll take my bedroll and sleep by the lake if I get caught by darkness. Finn said. 
He turned to Bud. Bud, will you protect my woman while I'm gone? Of course. Go make meat. In the early hours of the morning, Little Dove was attacked by an unknown assailant. She had her back turned and he choked her for a while to make her more compliant. Then he tugged up her buckskin skirt and roughly handled her private parts. Little Dove turned her head a little trying to see her assailant, but she couldn't see anything because it was so dark. It was one of those nights where there is no visible moon or stars because of heavy cloud cover. Just before he was getting himself positioned to rape her, she reached beneath her bedroll and pulled out her green river knife where she always kept it at night. She twisted around and slashed her assailant's arm. He screamed in pain and rage and ran away. It took her a few minutes to get her breathing normalized and she finally groped her way over and kicked Bud's bedroll to wake him. Bud, did you hear anything or see anything? Some man sneaked into our camp and tried to rape me. How could you possibly have slept through all of that? What? Somebody sneaked into our camp? I'm sorry. I'm a heavy sleeper. When Finn returns in the morning, we'll get on the bastard's trail and make him pay. I'm so sorry for you. Are you all right? I'm all right, but he choked me. I thought he was going to kill me. That's terrible. What man would do such a thing? An evil one. At first light, Finn rode in on his buckskin stallion toting a fat doe, a mule deer draped across the horse's haunches. Now we are going to eat proper like, Finn said. I'll butcher it and dry some of the meat and make pemmican later. But first I want to tell you something that just happened. Oh, what's going on? A man attacked me while I was sleeping and tried to rape me. He handled my lady parts roughly. Who was it? Did you see him? No, I had my back turned and it was so dark. He choked me until I almost passed out. Finn looked over at Bud. I thought I told you to watch over my woman. Finn, I'm sorry. I was sound asleep when it happened. I figure we can cut his sign and get on his trail right after breakfast. Finn stepped down from the stallion, and Little Dove rushed over and encircled him in her arms. Finn, I slashed the man's arm with my knife. Bud, let me see your arms, Finn said. You think I did it? That's an insult, and I will not dignify this by showing you my arms. Find yourself another partner. I've always wanted to go to Fort Pierre Chuteau over in South Dakota and join the army. The army provides food, shelter, clothing weapons, and horses. That seems like a good deal to me. Finn moved so fast it was unbelievable, and he jerked up the sleeve on Bud's right arm, and there it was, a knife slash. You son of a bitch. I can't believe you would betray me like this. You sure had me fooled, because I thought you were the salt of the earth. How did you figure you were going to get away with this? When I got done with her, I was going to knock her out, and when you returned, she'd be unconscious, and I'd be asleep. I thought that was a pretty good plan. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. She is such a luscious-looking little thing. But I'm going to tear your meat house down over this betrayal. Finn said. I'd advise against that. What do you weigh? About 200 pounds, I'd guess. So I outweigh you by 50 pounds, and none of my weight has run to fat. Just cut me loose and you'll never see me again. Even with a hurt shoulder, I can handle you. Suddenly, and with no warning, Bud quickly closed the distance between them and caught Finn up in a bear hug. He lifted Finn into the air and slammed him back down, and at the same time he yanked mightily inward, trying to break Finn over backwards. Finn's feet hit the ground and he braced himself for the inward tug and remained upright. Bud lifted him several more times and tried to break Finn over backwards, but failed. At that point, Bud realized that Finn was deceptively strong. Finn stood a little over six feet and weighed 200 pounds, 
and apparently it was all muscle. Bud was deciding what to do at that point, and he decided to let Finn go and commence with a fist fight. His shoulder was giving him a little grief, but he chose to ignore it. Before he could release Finn, though, Finn clapped open palms over both of his ears, a maneuver Cash had taught him. It broke both Bud's eardrums, and the pain was excruciating. While he was flailing about in great pain, Finn caught him flush in the mouth with a left hook. It split Bud's bottom lip open and blood gushed from the wound, and Bud went down in a heap. He was surprised the Yunker's punch felt like he had been kicked by a mule. Bud bounded to his feet, and he came in fast, and he caught Finn with a three-punch combination that was alarmingly fast for such a large man. Finn hit the ground hard and landed right on a boulder. He heard one of his ribs break and he had a deep cut over his right eye, and his lips were tingling and beginning to balloon up. The punches had hit so hard that he was right on the edge of going unconscious. Get up! Quick! Get up! Little Dove shouted. He's gonna stomp you! Finn wobbled back onto his feet and caught Bud up in a clinch. He held on long enough to regain the strength in his legs and have his head clear. Finally, he stepped back and the two men hammered each other with a flurry of punches. Bud was amazed that Finn was standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with him because he was so much bigger. Both went down twice, but rose to continue the fight. Bud was concentrating on finishing the fight with a mighty right hook, and it would have finished the fight all right if he had landed it. But Finn was a thinking fighter. He realized what Bud was trying to do and he moved his head left and right to avoid the mighty right hook. Finn hit him in the stomach several times, but it didn't seem to bother him much. Bud's stomach was corded with hard muscle. Finn hooked him from the right and from the left, and before long, Bud's face was a mask of gore. Both men were breathing heavily and sweating profusely. Every place that Bud hit him hurt. His arms, his shoulder, and his ribs. But it was obvious that Bud was tiring out faster than Finn, so Finn took advantage of that and brought in a combination of blows that staggered Bud. He caught Bud in the liver and nothing hurts worse. Bud's face contorted in agony and he lowered his right arm to rub the stricken area. Finn took advantage of that and hit him with a left hook square in the face. It broke Bud's nose and blood gushed from his nostrils. But Worst of all, Bud collapsed, the back of his legs fetched up against a log, and he went over backwards and never moved. Chapter 3 The Poisoning Bud lay on his back, wheezing and blowing bloody snot bubbles. Finn almost felt sorry for him, but considering what the man had done, he fell a little short on sympathy. Suddenly, Little Dove let out a shriek and dashed toward Bud with her knife. Finn reached out and caught her by the back of her tunic and halted her progress. Whoa there, woman. What the hell do you think you're doing? I'm gonna cut his throat. She shouted. No, you're not. He deserves it, but let's let him go. Bud groaned and got to his feet. What happened? He asked. You just got the hell kicked out of you by a man that you outweigh by 50 pounds. Bud's face was a wreck, and he moved about gingerly. His body had really taken a beating. His ribs hurt, and he suspected a couple of them were broken. Gather your stuff and get, Finn said. If I ever see you again, I'll kill you. I'm not sure I can ride. I hurt everywhere. Get, I mean it. I'm stove up quite badly myself, but I'm not whining about it. When Bud left, he was wobbling in the saddle. Do you think we have seen the last of him? Little Dove asked. I hope so, because killing him, even though he deserves it, would be unpleasant. Let's have a look at you, Little Dove said. Yes, you are a mess. I think we should spend the rest of the day here in camp to give you a chance to get feeling better before we ride. Let's ride. After we skin and dress out this deer. He reached up and tried to pull the deer off of his horse, 
but he cried out in pain and grabbed his ribs. See, you have a broken rib, she said. I'll need to wrap it and fix all of your cuts and bruises. Let's camp and I'll take care of the deer, jerk it, and make pemmican that we can eat on the trail. Then I'll stake out our horses and make us a venison stew. I can help, Finn said. No, you've done enough. I'm so proud of you. You beat that huge man. I can't believe it. I thought the brute was going to kill you. If you can handle a beast like him, I'm no longer worried about you handling yourself in fights. You are a great warrior. She hugged him tight and hurt his ribs. Then she kissed his lips and that hurt as well. Sorry, she said. She worked throughout the afternoon, taking care of the many chores involved in surviving in the wilderness. Then her last chore was picketing their horses, which included Finn's buckskin stallion named Buck, her roan mare named Sugar. Two pack horses and two ponies that belonged to miscreants they had killed the preceding fall. Little Dove, even if we don't get around to trapping for beaver because of this manhunt, we have four horses to sell and five fifty-four caliber hawk and rifles. Oh, and I have a little cash if we need it. Yes, don't worry, my man. We'll be all right. Little dove, good job. But hurry up and get in our bedroll, he wiggled his eyebrows. I've got a treat for you. My man, are you crazy? You have a broken rib, and your face and body is all beaten up. What you have in mind isn't going to happen. I don't want to be responsible for killing you. Dang, I'm all right. She laughed. Forget it. Two days later, they followed Rattlesnake's trail, and it led them straight toward the Assiniboines village near the Grand Tetons in Wyoming. The Grand Tetons in the Jackson Hole region is one of the world's most beautiful landscapes. Finn and Little Dove rode to the crest of a hill and looked down into the region. What they saw gladdened their hearts and thrilled them. I've never seen such a spectacle. It makes my heart sing, Finn said. Me too, Little Dove admitted. I've never been this far south before. The Jackson Hole Valley stretched out before them. It was discovered by John Coulter in 1807 when he completed his trek with the Lewis and Clark expedition to the Pacific. He also discovered Yellowstone. He spoke of the steaming vents, the colors, and the waterfalls. And at first, everybody just thought he was a mountain man spinning tall tales. Finn shook his head. Just imagine. I could be sitting behind a desk with poor lighting and ventilation at the cotton factory in Dublin. You know, if I die tomorrow, it will be worth it, seeing this beautiful western country. The valley was 50 miles long and from 6 to 13 miles wide, and it took their breath away. The gross Ventra River forked into the Snake River, sometimes called the Bad River, and flowed on in a more or less easterly course. Flocks of geese flew overhead in a chevron, honking their heads off, and ducks winged about. There were green-winged teals, northern pintails, and mallards. A bull moose had his head buried in a pond-eating horsetail, pond weeds, and grasses. He raised his head to look around, and water spilled from his muzzle. Would you like some moose meat? Finn asked. No. We need to travel light until we find Rattlesnake. Way off in the distance, a small herd of antelopes sped across the plain. Look at them. They must be running 60 miles an hour, Finn said. Yup, Little Dove admitted. A slight breeze was blowing into their faces, carrying with it the scent of wild peppermint drifting up from a nearby riverbank. A cutthroat trout rose and took a mayfly. After killing Finn and Little Dove's baby, Rattlesnake rode with speed south to the Assiniboine village on the Yellowstone River in Wyoming. The village hunters had just returned from a buffalo hunt, and they had brought in ten buffalo that would keep the village fed for most of the summer and provide them with other necessities. It was early in the spring. 
he went directly to the chief Black Eagle's teepee to tell him the three braves that had ridden out with him had been killed. The chief wanted to know the details about the killings. He wanted to know who killed them and why, because his son, Thunderhead, was among those killed. Rattlesnake lied to the chief and told him that his son had been killed by the members of a white man's wagon train. I've come back to get help from Swift Horse and four more warriors. With them, I will track down the wagon train and kill every member of the wagon train, and I will bring you back scalps, horses, mules, guns, cattle, and food. It shouldn't be hard to track them down because they are moving slow. Yes, Rattlesnake, go and join the feast and gorge yourself with buffalo meat tonight. But in the morning, go and do this thing. I'm tired of killing, but bring me the scalps of these white dogs. Rattlesnake bowed and stepped out of the chief's teepee. It will be done. Rattlesnake had lied to Chief Black Eagle because he wanted to wipe out the mountain men in the secret canyon after he attacked the wagon train. He intended on taking Swift Horse and the other four warriors with him to kill all of the mountain men in the canyon. He decided that after the two raids, he would return to the Assiniboines and bring them the spoils of the raid. It would please Chief Black Eagle. Then on some pretext he would leave again with Swift Horse and the rest of the warriors and occupy the canyon. He cooked up a grandiose scheme to use the hidden canyon as a hideout after he raided wagon trains passing through the region. It would be a perfect hideout. He supposed he should leave one of the warriors in the canyon to hold the women until he and the other four returned. He thought of the spoils obtained during the raids, and they would have white women to warm their bedrolls. The scheme couldn't fail. Someday, he would become a great chief. He figured eventually he would have to kill Chief Black Eagle, take the entire village into the secret canyon. There he would become a mighty war chief and build a powerful empire. Shortly after leaving Chief Black Eagle's teepee, Rattlesnake formulated a plan. He decided that if he was to become the chief of the Assiniboine village, he might as well take care of Black Eagle then and there. Earlier, Black Eagle had invited him to sit around in his teepee with other important members of the tribe and smoke the peace pipe, then join the villagers in a feast celebrating the successful buffalo hunt. He announced himself at the flap on the teepee and asked if he could enter. Rattlesnake stood there by the flap and waited. The flickering light of the campfires played across his face as he waited. He had a tattoo of a snake on the left side of his face, and he had darkened the perimeter around his eyes. Earlier that month, he used Pigeon, his wife, to scratch his skin with animal bones and make the tattoos with soot and minerals. The visage of Rattlesnake was the embodiment of evil. Enter, Black Eagle said. What brings you back? I thought you were feasting. I have changed my mind. It would be an honor to smoke the peace pipe with you and join the feast later to dance and listen to the drums. Come in. We were about to light the peace pipe, Black Eagle said. Rattlesnake smoked the peace pipe with Chief Black Eagle, Swift Horse, and two other warriors. The purpose for smoking the peace pipe was just what the name suggests to symbolize peace. That's what Chief Black Eagle most wanted after the killers of his son were brought to bay. His clan had been warring with the Blackfeet and other Native American tribes for decades. He was getting long in the tooth, and he wanted to spend his few remaining years in peace. He figured his people deserved it. He deserved it. But peace and tranquility was the last thing Rattlesnake wanted. When the pipe was handed to him, he almost laughed. He loved the blood sport, and he thrilled to killing people. He wanted to amass riches from exploiting and robbing others, particularly the whites that were invading their ancestral land. Before he took a puff on the pipe, he examined it closely, and he hated the sight of it. It was made from pine, and it was adorned with buckskin fringe, and the bowl and mouthpiece were fashioned from elk horn and it had a ridiculous medicine wheel attached to it. 
He reluctantly took a puff. Then he joined the celebrants out by the campfires. The celebration went on until the wee hours of the morning. Everybody gorged themselves on buffalo meat. They beat the drum incessantly, and the Assiniboines danced and laughed until they were exhausted. The drums kept up an incessant rhythm. Native drums are purported to invoke the gods, protect people, or create rain. But in this instance, the drums were simply to celebrate the bounty of buffalo meat they had brought into the village. Rattlesnake's demonic visage, accented by the firelight, scared people, and they shrunk from him. But they tried not to let him know they were afraid. But by and large, the thrumming of the drums brought most everybody to a state of ecstasy. When the party ended, Rattlesnake dragged a lovely squaw into his teepee and beat and raped her. Her father went to his teepee and pulled his knife from a scabbard. But in the end, he didn't dare break into Rattlesnake's teepee and try to kill him. The following morning, Rattlesnake gathered Swift Horse and four other Assiniboine warriors, and they prepared to leave on their raids. Before they left, Rattlesnake decided to take a major step in taking over as the chief. A fat squaw was cooking buffalo hump for breakfast. Do you have some meat for me and my men? Rattlesnake asked. Yes, a squaw that must have weighed 250 pounds said, but don't take that liver on that plate over there on that stump. That is for Chief Black Eagle. He loves the liver. When the fat squaw went into her teepee on an errand, rattlesnake pulled the head of a freshly killed rattlesnake from his war bag and sunk the fangs into the liver and kneaded the venom into the liver. The venom glands is located just behind the eyes. He knew that swallowing venom was not a surefire way of killing a man, but the chief was so old and infirm that it just might do the trick. Chief Black Eagle ate the raw liver with relish, and his stomach and throat went into spasms. He called out for help, but before anyone could reach him, he had a heart attack and passed on to the happy hunting ground. The fat squaw discovered his body and screamed out in alarm. The whole tribe assembled outside of the chief's teepee and set into wailing. Rattlesnake stepped into the midst of the morning crowd and announced he was taking over as chief. I'll be back after we get done raiding several wagon trains. I'll kill anyone that tries to take over as chief. Wait for me. I'll be back and we'll all have many horses, guns, and much food. Chapter 4 Bear Trouble Finn and Little Dove spent long hours in the saddle and approached the Yellowstone River. It was an ideal spot to camp, so they stopped there to spend the evening. It was a beautiful spot and there was plenty of beaver sign all around. After we run Rattlesnake to ground, maybe we should come back here and try our hand at trapping beaver, Finn suggested. Yes, Little Dove said. Cash gave me instructions on how to trap beaver, but I have to admit that after I catch one, I don't know how to skin it and prepare the pelt for market. So the big man admits he doesn't know everything. Don't worry, I know what to do after we catch them. I started working with beavers when I was eight years old. That's good. I'm thinking you and I are going to make a good team. Even in the sack, he wiggled his eyebrows. She giggled. Is that all you ever think of, getting me in the sack? No. Sometimes I think of food. She shook her head in exasperation. That reminds me. Have you ever eaten beaver tail? No. And I have to admit, it doesn't sound all that appetizing. The tail is located too close to their butt for my liking. She slapped him on the arm. What a thing to say. The first chance I get him, going to cook you some beaver tail, and I bet you'll like it. They set up their camp and leaned back on their bedrolls and watched the river flow by. It was peaceful and quiet, and they were almost lulled into sleep, listening to the burbling of the river as it flowed by on its journey to the Missouri River and eventually into the Atlantic Ocean. It was a magical time because the birds had quieted down and they only let out a couple peeps every now and then. The forest animals had quieted in preparation for slumber. 
But suddenly the tranquility was shattered when a bull boat rounded a curve in the river and came into view. Two mountain men were in the boat, and it was loaded heavily with beaver plues, equipment, and a four-point mule deer. The men were profaning, and one of them was crying out in pain. He was apparently injured. Finn stood up. I'll thank you to not use such foul language around my woman. Sorry, sir. We didn't see you there, one of them said. Zeb here got gored by this dang deer. Come to the bank, and my woman will attend to Zeb's injuries. She's good at such things. You do that after hearing our foul mouths? Of course, come to the bank. Finn was studying their boat as they brought it to the riverbank. It was made of willow branches fashioned into a bowl shape, and a bull buffalo hide was stretched across the branches, and it looked to be about four feet in diameter and about 18 inches deep. It was a crudely built thing, but it looked functional. The two mountain men stepped from the boat, and one of them had on a buckskin shirt saturated in blood, and he was moaning loudly. It was obvious that he was in great pain. They were dressed in buckskin from head to toe, and their clothing showed a lot of hard use, begrimed and ragged, and they both smelled bad. Both men had long, scruffy beards, and their hair hung down to their shoulders. My name is Oliver Tyler, and this fellow with the wound is Zeb Van Pelt. We are happy to make your acquaintance, Finn said. My name is Finn Sullivan, and this is my woman, Little Dove. I've only been in these Rocky Mountains for about a year, but I want you to be aware of something. Oh, what's that? Oliver asked. Don't mistake me for being green. We are prepared to fix up your injured partner, but I won't tolerate any nonsense from you. If you mess with my woman or try to steal from us, I will kill you both. Understood, Oliver said. Don't worry, we aren't that sort of men. You better not be. We've already had trouble with a big Swede that tried to take advantage of Little Dove when I was off hunting. He was a huge man, but when he rode away from our camp, he could hardly sit his horse. I beat him to a fare thee well. Is that what happened to your face? Oliver asked. Yes, whipping him wasn't easy. Now, pull Zeb's bedroll from your bull boat and stretch it out by the fire, and Little Dove will go to work on him. How did this happen? Zeb shot the deer, and when he walked up to cut its throat, it jumped up and gored him. A tenderfoot mistake. Zeb should have made certain the buck was dead before he approached it. I had to shoot the buck again to get him stretched out for good. Little Dove thoroughly cleaned Zeb's wound with herbs she carried in her medicine kit. She dug deeply into the wound, and Zeb put up a howling that could be heard for miles around. Do you have to do that? No, I can just let it go and you can get an infection, she said. Once the wound was cleaned up nicely, she sewed it shut with catgut and a big needle used for sewing clothing, and Zeb yowled even more. Finally, she made a poultice with yarrow and elderberry, both healing plants native to Montana, which would serve to draw out the infection. Then she wrapped it tight with clean buckskin. You'll need to change this bandage every day, or you will get an infection and die. She doesn't mince her words, does she? Oliver asked. No, she doesn't, Finn said. Would it be all right if we camped here for the night? Oliver asked. Yes, of course. Zeb needs to rest up some before you leave. But let me warn you, no funny business. We have already been betrayed by a Swede named Bud Bergstrom. I told you about him earlier. We thought he was the salt of the earth, but we found out that wasn't the case. I assure you we aren't bad men, Oliver said. Finn pointed to a clear spot near the campfire. Throw your bedrolls over there. Finn, would you like a hind quarter of mule deer? No, thank you. I killed a deer a couple days ago. While you're setting up your camp and dressing out that deer... I will fry you some venison, and I'll make Zeb a nice broth. 
Broth is the best thing for an injured man. It restores the blood, Little Dove said. Wah, you'd do that for us? Oliver asked. Of course, but I would expect help from you if we ever need it. Where are you fellers headed? Finn asked. I see you have quite a few beaver plues. Are you headed to Teos or St. Louis to sell them? No, we're going to the rendezvous. Where's it being held this year? Finn asked. It's being held at the west foot of one of the Tetons this year. When does it start? June 13. Finn looked over at Little Dove. We probably won't make it to the rendezvous this year. It's being held in under a month, and we've got a lot to do. How come? Oliver asked. Two reasons. We're looking for an Indian to kill, and a Cinnaboyne, and we don't have any beaver plues to sell. That's a shame. It's one hell of a shindig. What Indian are you after? Finn put his arm around Little Dove. His name is Rattlesnake. He killed our two-month-old baby daughter. Shot her with an arrow. We won't rest until he's dead. Oliver shook his head. That's some tough luck. Be careful when you catch up with him. He's one evil son of a bitch. He's so fast he can snatch a double eagle off a rattler's head and leave change. It's hard to tell how many people he's killed. Do you know where the Assiniboine village is? Oliver raised his eyebrows. Yes. We're heading that direction. What if we all traveled together? In that way, Little Dove could doctor up old Zeb from time to time. Maybe we could ride a couple of those extra horses you have and abandon the bull boat. I'd hate to lose Zeb. He has sand and he has been a good partner to ride the river with. We've been together nigh on a decade. Well, I don't know about that. We hardly know you, Finn said. Finn, what do I have to do to prove to you we are good people? We have never harmed another soul on this spinning globe unless they attacked us first. They can travel with us. I trust them, Little Dove said. All right, but keep in mind at the first treachery. I'll cut you both loose from your suspenders, Finn said. Good, it's settled, but why do you want to go to the Assiniboine village? Oliver asked. We want to know if Rattlesnake is there or if he isn't. We want to find out where he went. I wouldn't advise going there, Oliver said. If you go there, you just might lose your top knots. The Assiniboines have mostly been warlike people. We'll risk it. Rattlesnake has to pay for killing our baby girl. Finn looked over at Little Dove and big tears had puddled in the corners of her eyes. How about this? Oliver said. I'll go in and see if Chief Black Eagle knows the whereabouts of Rattlesnake. You do that? You aren't worried about your top knot? Finn asked. No, old Zeb and I pulled one of his grandsons out of the Yellowstone River. The young brave was fixing to get himself drowned. You've got a deal. You can tag along with us, and Little Dove will doctor Zeb and you'll talk to Black Eagle. The following morning, the sky looked like the belly feathers of a goose. They wondered if it was an omen. The encampment woke up to a blood-curdling scream. It was Little Dove. She was in the brush next to the Yellowstone River. She had gone after water. Finn grabbed his rifle and a horse pistol and sprinted toward the screams. A black bear saw, followed by a cub, was stalking Little Dove. It had her backed up to the river. It looked like she had two choices, get mauled by the sow or drown in the river. Neither seemed appealing. Black bears go to their dens in mid-December when the food dries up. The males come out of hibernation in mid-March, but the sows stay holed up until mid-May because generally they have cubs to care for. This sow had a cub, and she was being protective. Finn took aim and shot the sow with his fifty caliber hawken. The ball knocked her down, but he missed hitting her in a vital spot. He aimed just behind her front shoulder, but he hit her lower and in her stomach. 
She jumped up and came for him, so he pulled his Patterson Colt horse pistol and shot her again. She went down but came right back up and headed for him. He looked around for a tree to climb, but the nearest tree was 100 yards off. The enraged sow charged at him like a locomotive, so he pulled his green river knife, but he knew the knife would be ineffective and he was about to die. When the sow got within 20 feet of him, he heard an extremely loud shot and the sow collapsed, kicked a bit, and then lay still. Oliver had saved the day. Thank you, Oliver. I thought I was going under. Think nothing of it. It's what friends do, Oliver said. I've heard tell that grizzlies are really hard to kill, but I thought a black bear would be much easier. Oh, you'd be surprised, Oliver said. They heard some loud cries and saw the cub being pulled along by the strong current in the Yellowstone River. Apparently the little fellow panicked and jumped into the river, Oliver said. But it's probably for the best. Without his mother, the little fellow wouldn't stand a chance. Chapter 5. Butchery When they arrived back at the camp, they all went to work cooking breakfast and breaking camp. Oliver, thank you. You saved my life. If you hadn't shot that black bear in the nick of time, I would be a gone beaver. Think nothing of it. It's what friends do, Oliver said, and he walked over and gave Zeb a nudge to wake him. Little Dove wants you to take in some more of the venison broth. Zeb never moved. Zeb was dead. Oliver felt for his pulse, and there wasn't one. Old Zeb has passed over to the other side. He must have been cut up inside even worse than we realized. I'm going to miss him. A fella couldn't ask for a better man to ride the river with. His eyes filled with tears. Little Dove encircled him in her arms to give him comfort and Finn patted him on the back. We're sorry, Oliver. We know how you feel. We lost a good friend named Cash Jackson. An Indian named Wolverine killed him last fall. They spent the better part of the morning burying Zeb Van Pelt and fashioning him a cross with an inscription. Oliver said a little prayer over his gravesite. He didn't remember the entire prayer, but he figured what he did remember would suffice. God, our Father, your power brings us to birth. Your providence guides our lives, and by your command we return to the dust. The Rocky Mountains are replete with graves of the Western immigrants. The Rockies are beautiful but unforgiving. A man can die any number of ways. Snake bites, drownings, falling accidents, gunshot wounds, arrow wounds, horse wrecks, bear and cougar maulings, exposure to the elements, starvation, and the list goes on. Survivors are the cautious and robust. They have to be. Before they mounted their horses, Finn turned to Little Dove. Little Dove, this is so embarrassing some little bug has buried itself in my manly parts and it's starting to itch. Let's step in behind the brush so I can have a look, Little Dove said. Not on your life, in case you haven't noticed. I'm quite modest. Little Dove laughed. Don't be silly. I've seen you naked before. All right, let's get it done. They went back behind the brush and Finn lowered his buckskin trousers. Huh, just like I thought, you have a tick. Can you pry him loose and let him drop? Nope, if I do that, his head and little stinger will stay lodged in there. Wait here, and I'll be back with just the thing to make the tick let loose from you. They like burrowing in the tender parts of a man or woman's body. It's less work for them. Little Dove returned with a twig that was burning on the end. Finn was horrified. You ain't gonna dab fire onto my danged crotch. Are you crazy, woman? Little Dove laughed until she shook. Don't be a baby. You'll only receive a minor burn, and you'll be rid of the tick. Let's just leave him be, he said. He won't eat much. My mother used to deal with ticks all of the time. If it is infected, in about two weeks you'll get a rash, fever, headache, and sore muscles. It could eventually kill you. 
All right, go ahead, but be dang careful. She couldn't help it. She giggled some more and she had to wait a little in order to steady her hand. She touched the firebrand to the tick and it let loose and dropped to the ground. Finn had a minor burn on his nether parts. She went back to the pack horse and fetched a little salve to put on the burn. You'll be good as new in a couple days, she said, fighting off a giggle. I can't understand how a man who fights bravely with fists, guns, knives, and hawks can get so spooked over a little dab of fire. You just wait, he said. Maybe sometime you'll get a tick attached to you and we'll see how brave you are when I throw some fire to it. She laughed. I'm sure I will handle it better than you. He grabbed her and gave her a savage kiss on her lips to shut her up. You beast, she said, and she cuffed him on the arm. When they rode away from the camp, they had a sagebrush plain to traverse. They were riding and leading their pack horses and extra horses through little pathways between the sagebrush. The air was redolent with the piquant odor of sagebrush, an odor near and dear to a frontiersman's heart. The sagebrush heaved and rolled to a distant plain, and the three tetons were off in the distance and shimmering in curiously refracted light. The sky was a lovely blue that morning in contrast to what it should have been, black and somber, due to Zeb's death. Weather in the Rockies is whimsical. It does what it wants regardless of a man's mood. After a long ride, they neared the Assiniboine village with the three Teton peaks as a backdrop. You hang back, Oliver said, and I'll go in and see if I can find out where Rattlesnake has gone. Who knows? Maybe he's still in the village. If he is, you'd best not try to go in and kill him. You should wait until he leaves and then close in on him. Finn and Little Dove tied their horses up and low crawled to the top of the ridge and peeked over the crest. They took care to not skyline themselves at the crest of the ridge in order to not be seen. As far as Indian villages go, this Assiniboine village was quite attractive. The teepees were decorated in gay colors with intricate designs. A hawk swept overhead and dived on a sparrow descending toward the valley below. He picked the sparrow out of the air as slick as you please. Breakfast, Finn said, pointing to the hawk. Oliver rode into the Assiniboine village, fearing he might have, for some reason, fell out of favor with Chief Black Eagle, and he thought he might lose his top knot. The village was a hub of activity. Squaws were busy working with buffalo hides, and several were at the river washing clothing, and the children were scurrying about playing. They were shooting arrows at a target, playing blind man's bluff, playing hide and seek, and some were having foot races. Everything looked normal to Oliver, but he wondered where Chief Black Eagle was. He asked a squaw where he could find him. He died yesterday. We think Rattlesnake poisoned him. He is laid out on a scaffold high in a burial tree down by the river. That's a shame. He was a fine man, Oliver said. He could see some slashes on her arms. She had apparently taken a knife to herself in grief. Where are all the braves today? Most of them are off on raids. They are stealing horses from the Utes over in Green River and some of the elderly braves are in the sweat lodge having a purification ceremony. They want to appeal to our Creator and grow physically and spiritually. They feel great sorrow at the loss of our chief. Oliver looked over, and the sweat lodge had smoke billowing out of the smoke hole in the middle. A sweat lodge is pieced together by tree branches as a framework, and it has animal hides draped over it as a cover. There is a hole dug in the ground in the center of the lodge. The Indians heat rocks over a fire, and they throw the rocks in the hole and pour water over them. It creates steam, and the temperature in the lodge will rise a little higher than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. He didn't want to interrupt their ceremony, so he sought to find where Rattlesnake had gotten off to from the squaw. Do you know where Rattlesnake got off to? Oliver asked. Why do you want to know, white man? I'm asking for a friend, Oliver said. 
He headed south of here. He's going to raid wagon trains on the Oregon Trail. Thank you. Rattlesnake is an evil man. Does your friend want to kill him? The squaw asked. Can you keep a secret? Yes. He wants to kill him. He killed their two-month-old daughter, shot her with an arrow. I wish them luck. He has taken over as our chief, and I fear for our people under his leadership. I hope they kill him and cut out his black heart, she said, and she spat on the ground. Back along the trail, Finn and Little Dove waited patiently for Oliver to return and hopefully have news of Rattlesnake's whereabouts. While they waited... They admired a tract of land resplendent with wildflowers. There was a dazzling array of colors that seemed to glow in the early afternoon sunshine. There was Indian paintbrush, bitterroot, Wyoming lupine, and perhaps the most beautiful was the delicate columbine done up in shades of blue, purple, orange, yellow, white, and pink. Looking at these flowers makes my heart sing, Little Dove said. They are beautiful, Finn said. The Timothy Jenkins wagon train was on its way to Oregon. They were pioneers, anxious to take up farming and other enterprises in Oregon. They had left St. Louis ten weeks earlier, and they were anxious to get to Oregon. They had heard you could grow most anything in Oregon soil. The wagon train consisted of only four Conestoga wagons, and a total of 16 people, including men, women, and children. There were only four men that could put up a fight if they ran into trouble. Each wagon was being pulled by six yoked oxen, and they kept a couple in reserve in case any of the them went lame or got tuckered out. The wagon train was like a traveling menagerie. There were several draft horses, riding horses, cattle, goats, dogs, and pigs. Timothy's wife, Beatrice, had control of the ribbons and was driving their wagon, and Timothy was riding a horse alongside. A ten-year-old boy was trudging along on foot, and they had a two-year-old girl and a six-month-old baby girl in the back that was fussing. I don't know why I let you talk me into this, Beatrice said. I am so weary I can hardly hold my head up, and our dear children... How much farther do we have to go? I wish you would agree to turn back. Buck up, Beatrice. We're about halfway. You'll see. It will be worth it. I've been told that Oregon is like paradise. You better be right because our children are hanging on by a thread. Several people have already died in our little caravan. They were old and not young and hardy like us. You better go hunting this afternoon. We are nearly out of meat, Beatrice said. This wagon train was among the vanguard heading west. The movement had begun in earnest the year before in 1831. About a decade later, the dam broke, so to speak, and hordes of Easterners, including the Mormons, poured onto the trails and headed west to the Promised Land, and many would die along the trails because it was a brutal voyage. It has been said that 50,000 people or one-tenth of the people crossing the continent died. Many times the dead were buried right in the trail so that the wagons would tamp the earth down solid to keep the carry-on eaters from digging them up and eating them. Rattlesnake and the five Assiniboine warriors he chose to accompany him on raids had been trailing the Timothy Jenkins wagon train for two days. They hung far enough back so that the immigrant party didn't know they were being followed. They bided their time until the wagon train rode into the middle of a narrow canyon. That would be a good place to make the attack. Rattlesnake took two of the warriors with him, and they slipped by the wagon train party. The three of us will come in from the front, and you three attack from the rear. We will have them hemmed in and they won't be able to escape from the sides because of the steep canyon walls. We'll attack early in the morning when they least expect it. Kill them all except for the women. We'll have some fun with them first, and then we'll kill them. This will be the first of many raids. 
will make the white dogs pay for coming onto our land. The raiding party hit right at dusk, and the immigrants didn't have a chance. They would never get a chance to run a plow through the rich Oregon soil, or to build homes, or later on to build a town with churches, schools, livery stables, grist mills, and all else. Rattlesnake and his bloodthirsty warriors killed all the men and children first, cut them down before the men had a chance to pick up their rifles and fight back. They systematically cut the children to pieces with their knives and hawks to save arrows and balls and DuPont. The children cried, begged, and bleated like sheep as they were slaughtered. It was a scene that would horrify any human being with a semblance of a conscience but it never seemed to bother the war party. Once that was done, the six savages tore the nightgowns off the women and did unspeakable sexual things to them, laughing all the time, as the women cried and begged for mercy. Once that was done, the savages sliced and diced the women, obviously enjoying their work. The last woman to die was Mrs. Jenkins. She realized she had been right all along. The Jenkins family should have stayed in St. Louis. Her last thoughts were of her children, her dear children. She was tormented with the knowledge of how they had been slaughtered, of the pain they must have suffered. When it was over, the scene closely resembled an abattoir. When Oliver returned from the Assiniboine village, Finn was anxious to find out what he had learned. All of the braves are off on horse raids. The elderly men were in a sweat lodge, so I had to talk to a squaw. She told me that Rattlesnake more than likely killed Chief Black Eagle and had taken over as chief. She was scared and sad about that prospect. She said Rattlesnake took five warriors with him and headed south to raid immigrant wagon trains on the Oregon Trail. I'm sure she was telling the truth, Oliver said. Good, let's get after him. I suppose you'll want to travel with us until you get to the rendezvous, Finn said. Yes, if we find Rattlesnake, I'll help you kill the treacherous son of a bitch. He looked over at Little Dove. Sorry about the language, ma'am. Don't worry about it, she said. That's what he is. They rode for a short distance and spotted smoke rising from the far side of a rise. They rode up to a scene so horrific that none of them would ever forget it. The plain was littered with dead men, women, and children. Their bodies had been mutilated, cut to pieces with knives and hawks. The women had been raped. They were naked. Several animals were lying dead as well. Rattlesnake and his band had taken the harnesses off the oxen and taken them along with them. They would feed the Assiniboine tribe's people for a good while. Tools, furniture, cooking utensils, barrels, and other household items were strewn along the plain, and the wagons were burning. Finn and Oliver found a couple shovels and spent several hours working toward burying all of the dead, and Little Dove used her horse to pull all the bodies up next to the graves in preparation for interment. She located several house dresses and dressed the women, and she combed all of the victims' hair and tidied them up. She figured that was the least she could do. They piled the bodies three or four to the grave and backfilled the holes. Then they read a little Bible scripture over them. Little Dove wept, and the men worked hard to fight off the tears. Look at that grand piano over there, Finn said. I imagine it strained hell out of the oxen that had to pull it along. One wagon hadn't been burned, so they walked over to look inside it. It was filled with useful items to start a new life in Oregon. Then and it happened. They heard a noise from deep in the wagon. That sounds like a baby fussin, Finn said. They couldn't believe it. It was a baby girl and she looked to be about six months old. Little Dove brought the baby out into the sunlight. The baby had the biggest blue eyes she had ever seen and a mop of blonde hair. She was the most beautiful baby Little Dove had ever seen, and she fell instantly in love with the little bundle. Little Dove hugged the little girl tightly. Don't squeeze her to death, Finn said. I bet this little thing is hungry, 
she said. She put the baby to her breast and it fed hungrily. Little Dove was glad her milk hadn't yet dried up from when she had given birth recently. It looks like our family has just grown a little, Finn said. Yes, this precious little thing is mine, Little Dove said. Ours, Finn corrected. What are you going to name her? Azure, because of her eyes, Little Dove said. Many years ago, a Catholic priest taught me the word that describes a beautiful shade of blue. This concludes Part 1 of Finn Sullivan Mountain Man, Rattlesnake, Book 2, by author Scotty V. Casper, published by Dusty Saddle Publishing. Thank you for joining us on our read and stay tuned for Part 2. Pick up more from Scotty V. Casper on Amazon, available on Kindle and paperback. Visit our website at dspublishingnetwork.com. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you have enjoyed listening to this story. Until next time.